Good morning, everyone. I know that I'm the only thing standing between you and lunch, so I'll try to make this quick and easy. But before we continue, let me just do something that I really want to do. So, it one more. Okay, it should be. Okay, so let's start. When preparing this presentation, I thought a cool title would be <coughs> Hardcore Mobile Integrations. Actually, our marketing team was not very convinced. They were like, no, oh, hardcore might resemble bad things, you know? So, so I was like, okay, we are at our systems, we also like to make things easy. So make things easy and also come up with new names. We really like to do it. So I decided to come up with a new name, which is EasyCore. Easy Core Mobile Integrations. So, as Paulo Rosado talked yesterday, we want to take full advantage of the device capabilities. And in order to do so, we actually have to build to integrate with the actual, with the device. But before we continue, uh, actually Vera already said who I was, but who am I? So my name is Ruben Gonçalves. I've been working for OutSystems since 2009 and I'm cur currently leading the mobile team services. So, so meaning that we build front-end part, we build the native shell, we build everything. So our daily basis, our daily work is actually all related with mobile. How many of you have actually already built a mobile app that, that integrates with the native shell? Okay, don't be shy, raise your hands really high, okay. We see a couple of heads, very well. But to establish a common ground, actually, let's first see what is a smartphone. Well, everyone knows that this is a smartphone, right? But in our perspective, in the developer's perspective, what is a smartphone? A smartphone is actually composed with several technologies. These technologies and devices that we can actually use in our applications. And by the end of this presentation, hopefully, you'll be eager to integrate with all of them. And you'll see how easy, easy it is to do. Something that is also very important to know about this, this, the device and all of these features is that they are always in our user's pocket, meaning they are ready to be used. They are right there. It's us who are not taking part of it. We are not taking leverage. So what makes a great mobile app? First of all, a great mobile app, it's easy to use. Meaning, an example of this is City Mapper that allows you to run inside the city and to understand the city, how it, you can go to point A to point B in the most effective way. The next characteristic is that it's quick to use. Because as most of you know, typically the use of smartphones, since it's always with you, is a lot in those small idle times, meaning when you are waiting for the bus in the bus stop, or when you are actually between, that, between entrances. <coughs> Another one is actually it solves a real life problem. Imagine this application called Revolut enables you to exchange money and currencies while you are traveling around the world in a very simple way without fees. And a small detail here is that actually 60% of startups fail because they are not trying to solve a real life problem, a real world problem. And finally, it's context aware. And this ex example is from Estimote, and when you get into to the store, you are immediately um, invited to uh, take advantage of this discount on the pair of shoes. During this presentation, we'll be focusing on making our application context aware. How so? Of all of those characteristics that we have seen on the smartphone, we'll first take, only take leverage of these three or four technologies. The first one is actually geofence, and we'll see what is a geofence, we'll see examples of geofence in, in action, but also uh, how it actually works under the hood, because we are all engineers, and to understand how to use something, we, did, we do need to understand how it actually works. The next one is actually beacons. We'll understand how it works in terms of the Bluetooth and so on, and how it can be used, and examples of its usage. Finally, the next technology is actually NFC. 
And the same thing applies. We'll see how, it's, how it works, how it can be used, and examples of its, of its usage. Another thing that I was doing when preparing this presentation was thinking, what would be the most risky thing to do in a presentation? And obviously, it would be to build something live. So we are going to see, uh, close to the end of this presentation, we'll build a plugin from scratch, and one application to use that plugin from scratch, and hopefully everything will go well, and it will work. Otherwise, it will be interesting. So let's get started with this, and let's see, have a technology overview. Let's start with geofence. So what is a geofence? A geofence is a virtual parameter in the real world, and it's defined by a coordinate and a radius or a set of coordinates. And what it enables to do is to create a fencing area so that when our user with the application crosses that fencing area, meaning when it enters that area or when it exits, we are able to actually to trigger an alert. Probably, if you have installed Next App application, you notice that when you got close to CCB, you received a push notification saying, oh, you are getting close to the, to the event, uh, let's, get gui let's guide you to, to actually to the entrance. Another example of how it can be used is, for example, voucher call, cloud, and in which where what they are doing is that they are defining specific um, areas when the user of that application goes to that area, they are able to promote and to tell them, okay, there is a really nice discount in this store if you actually go there now. Another one is actually to survey or welcome customers. Just like we did in Next Step, Uber is doing that when you get to San Francisco. They invite you, welcome to San Francisco. Do you want a ride? We are here to pick you up if you want to. Another one is actually for our houses to become more context aware. Meaning, this, this for example, Honeywell is creating a, a smart house in which the house is able to understand when you are actually leaving a given perimeter from the house, or meaning when you are leaving the house, it can actually turn off the AC and turn off the lights. And when you are getting home again, it can actually start warming up the house and so that when you get there, the house is ready to receive you. So it's cool examples, but for us engineers, how does it work under the hood? So the first thing is that our application registers in the, for example, in iOS, in the core location services, so that, look, I want to be informed when the user crosses this fencing area. So the operating system is the one responsible for actually alerting the, the application of the enters or exit of the user. It actually takes also, it leverages the GPS, but not only the GPS, the Wi-Fi and the antenna. And something that is pretty scary is that, for example, Google and Apple and all of these big providers, they have been mapping all of the Wi-Fi's in the world with location. Meaning, if you have your Wi-Fi connected in your device and you just pass next to a Wi-Fi, actually the Android or iOS knows where you are just because you actually get in touch with that Wi-Fi. Yes, they are doing that. Another one is actually, this is a transition-based event. So this is a transition-based technology. So as soon as the user actually crosses that virtual perimeter, the operating system is able to alert our application and tell, oh, your user has actually entered this region. And the same applies when he actually exits. But when he is inside, we have no exactly clue or the operating system actually doesn't tell us anything. And what are the limitations? Because obviously there, there would be limitations. The first one is that when you are trying to use this outside of the cities and due to the lack of, of obviously of Wi-Fi, the minimum radius that you can consider is 500 meters. You cannot go smaller than that. In cities, by the way, it's 100 meters. The next one is in Android, for example, if you have the GPS and the Wi-Fi disconnected, it might even not work at all. You might not even have receive any notification. Finally, in iOS, you, each app can only monitor 20 regions. No more than that. Meaning you can only register 20 regions, regions to be notified about the user getting in or getting out. Now moving forward to the next technology, which is beacons. 
So what is a beacon? A beacon is a lighthouse. But instead of actually sending out light, what it's doing is it's actually sending, it's broadcasting signal, Bluetooth signal. And in this case, Bluetooth low energy signal. It's actually a one-way transmitter because it's just like a lighthouse. It's just pushing out and informing the boats that they are close to the shore. And in this case, it's informing our applications that they are close to their application. So they do not connect to the devices. They do not connect to the Wi-Fi. They are standalone devices. Examples of usage is, for example, the Houston Zoo. They are actually creating guided tours for, their, uh, for the people visiting it using beacons. So each cage of the animal has a specific beacon. <laughs> and, and when the, the visitor gets close to the cage, has the ability to immediately to be pushed information about that animal. Another one is actually a red eye um, app that enables to bridge the gap between the reality and the application. So in this app, the architects are able to put all of the plans of a given building. And by setting the beacons in specific areas, the app is able to show exactly the plant and the exactly where they are uh, on the plant. Another one also related with the house is, imagine that you go to a specific room of the house, you are able to disconnect or to connect the lights of that specific room because there is a beacon and because your application knows that you are in that specific room. And how does it work? So have we, as we were saying, um, it works with Bluetooth low energy. Before I continue, uh, actually, not here, done, not here. So we are broadcasting power, and the more power we are broadcasting, actually, the bigger the range is. And in the case of Estimote, it's, it goes up to 70 meters of range. It also, like I said, it's a lighthouse, so it's not always emitting the signal. So we can also, um, change the advertising interval and make it between 100 milliseconds or two seconds. Why is this important? For example, in iOS, the operating system is looking for beacons every one second. So it means that the shorter the amount of time we, we have in terms of the advertising, the more, the more possible will be it for the, or the faster it will be for the operating system to catch the signal. Additionally, this will have impact on the battery on the other side. So the more common, more, less interval we have, the more battery to consume. It's, it's also a transition-based event, meaning when the user actually gets in, in the region, we get a notification from the operating system, and when he gets out, we get a notification as well. Bear in mind that in iOS, it, the, the, the exit notification is delayed 30 seconds. Why? Because actually the user, right after exiting the region, it can actually enter the region again. Additionally, the operating system also tells us the distance, such as if we are near it, meaning if you are really, really close to it, if we are near it, less than three meters, or actually if, you are, if we are far away from it. The beacons then can be composed in regions. And these regions can have multiple beacons. This enables us to actually to span the area of our beacons and for these, for these to be a single region. Okay, so that if we enter in the, in the context one, of one beacon, we are notified, and if we exit in the context of a, the next beacon, we are also notified. Regarding the limitations, is high interference materials are metal and water. Well, guess what's 70% of water? Yes. So one of the recommendations that they, they give is, don't be shy, put your beacon really, really high. Otherwise, your signal will be lost in the people's body. Another one is that, just like in geofence, beacons, you are only able to register 20. An interesting thing here, or actually not, is that a beacon is also counted as a region. Meaning, if you are using geofence and beacons, the number of regions will start diminishing. The number of the ones that you can actually uh, be looking for or monitoring in your application. For example, the app of Next Step was using or is using geofence and beacons. And in this case, one region of each means that it only can monitor 12, uh, 18 more regions if we wanted to. 
moving forward to the next te technology and trying to go fast so that we can go to the cool part. NFC, what is NFC? NFC stands for Near Field Communication. And it enables us to actually to do something really cool that we'll see. Actually, NFC is a subset of our FID. And when it, actually we start seeing NFC, it's really confusing. What's, what's the difference between NFC and F, R, R FID? And actually, it's just a subset. And it works in the bandwidth of 13.56 megahertz. Another is that it enables us to, uh, unlike RFID, I'm sorry, that enables you to communicate, communicate long distance, um, NFC is for short distance, up to four centimeters communication. And it enables us a really cool thing, which is for our tags not to have battery. So you can have a, div a device, an active device and a passive device. And the passive device might be without battery and will only work when it's actually powered on by the active device. Examples of usage are, for example, unlocking door. And this is a very, very common example nowadays, but with contactless cards. And that we can use our, nowadays also our smartphone to do it. It can actually replace completely the contactless cards. Because if we have NFC in our smartphone, there is no reason why we need a contactless card, such as our public transport, our mass transit card. And finally, it's used to transfer close by information. So an example of this is actually our, uh, our customer, Charles River. They are using that to identify animals in the cages. And what they do is actually you can see the small tag right there, the NFC tag. And they actually grab on the, the box of the animal and they get close to the, where they have the receptor, which is next to that chest. They read the animal and they start working with the animal so that the system is immediately aware of what is the animal that they are working on and what are the tasks due to that animal. Once again, how does it work? Before I continue in this part, is there any expert in electromagnetic waves in the room? No. So, <laughs> it works with the inductive coupling principle, meaning there is a, an active device that will actually create a magnetic field, then this magnetic field will be what will power up the passive device. And the passive device will actually distort, this is the part where the, the other person will correct me, will distort the magnetic waves so that the active device will be able to read the information that is stored on the, on, the, on the passive device. And as we have seen, actually, the passive device can actually store up to eight kilobytes of information. And the transfer rate is actually really high compared to the amount of information that is stored. What this means is NFC, unlike Bluetooth, where you need to pair first, it doesn't need pairing. And the transfer rate is so close that the reading information is instantaneously. It just gets it close and it immediately reads that information. It has actually several working models. It can work you know, on a peer-to-peer -peer where we have two active devices transferring information one to the other. An interesting thing is that devices can take turns in powering up to avoid wasting battery. You can, we can have read-write mode where we have an active device and a passive device. And in this case, this was Nokia showing the technology and showing that you can have a passive device near when you exit home. And when you get close with a smartphone, immediately the weather application starts and shows you the temperature so that you know what to take outside. And we have also card emulation. And something interesting is that not all iPhones can actually use Apple Pay. Not all Androids can actually use Google Wallet. Why? Because actually for them to be able to do card emulation, it needs to have more hardware because of the security. And what are the limitations? Well, the biggest limitation is actually in iOS, you are not able to use NFC at all. Well, iPhones starting from 5S, if I'm not wrong, they have NFC, but it's only for Apple use. You cannot use it, unfortunately. I would advise you to check out this, this track right, in, right next launch, because they are going to use some of these technologies. So you might want to see them in action and see how you can actually use them. 
So recap, geofences, they work with GPS and Wi-Fi, and they are used to create large virtual parameters. Beacons, they work with Bluetooth low energy, and they enable your app to be more local aware. NFC, they work really close by, so they enable your app to get object information. So you might be asking, so you gave us a lot of context of these technologies, but how does P10 help us? Does it help us at all? Well, obviously it helps, otherwise I wouldn't be here. <laughs> so it has already ready-to-use plugins, such as the Geofence plugin, the Beacons plugin, the NFC plugin. But not only these, it has plenty of other plugins and more to be added in the meantime. So all of these plugins will be available for you to use in your applications and to leverage this technology. So what do you need to create a, pl a plugin wrapper? Because obviously we have seen in the yesterday's, uh, yesterday's uh, demo how we can actually integrate a native functionality. But talking, now taking to the reality, something that you need to do obviously is to isolate that integration because bottom line, this is also an integration. So we should create a module a wrapper for that plugin that will expose an API on how to use that plugin in the out systems way, obviously. So to create a wrapper, what you should do is you should search for a core of a plugin, then you, you should create the wrapper for it, a module that will actually have the information of where the plugin is in the GitHub, but will also have the API for it to use, and also publish it, and it's ready to use in your application. Sorry. Cordova. Cordova. Yes. What Missed that. Okay. Yes, I'm, we are going to see that. Because now it's the part where we are going to do the hands-on, finally. So. <coughs> so bury me, because first I need to change the display. Okay, let's see how it goes. And it is done, except that I lost my mouse. Okay, very well. So first, let's connect to Service Studio and connect to our environment. Obviously, had to go to the other screen. Okay. So let's start by creating the wrapper. So you have noticed that now we have two options to create the mobile app and the web app. Since we are going to create a wrapper for the mobile app, we are going to create, to choose the left side. We are going to create a phone and we could create a ta tablet, but in this case it's phone and we are going to name it. By the way, we are going to do a flashlight. Flashlight plugin. Okay, let's create a blank module. So someone unpinned things. Ha. So First, let's look for the Cordova plugins. We go to cordova.apache.org slash plugins, and you notice that we have 1,200 plugins. So now let's look for flashlight. Here we have it. And now notice we have here the link. This is important and we can see here how we can actually use it. So first, let me actually go to my notes. Obviously not on this screen. This didn't happen on the dry run, obviously. Okay, so let's copy past first. 
this information, you'll notice that on the module, we now have the configurations part, where you can actually put here this JSON. Now we can bring the link from here and put here in the URL, add the dot .jit on the end. And finally, we want actually to create some client-side actions for us to use. So the first one will be turn on. And we will use the window plugin switch on. So as you've seen in the previous presentation from uh, Vasco and Ricardo, you can actually create a JavaScript node to extend the functionality. It, and that's exactly what we're going to do. So this is turn on, switch on, and then we are going to have a turn off. Oh, by the way, this needs to be public. Turn off. And this will be turn off. OK, this is still not public. Cool. So our wrapper is now done. We have add, actually wrapped the turn on and turn off of the light. Now what we are going to do is actually to create the application that will actually use it. It wouldn't be risky if I didn't have to bring it, uh, to do everything from scratch, right? So, so let's upload a logo that will be this one of our application. Remember, bear in mind, this will also be the logo for our native application. So it will be called Flashlight, obviously is. <laughs> you guys make me nervous. So let's create a new mobile module. First thing that I'm going to do, because I want total freedom, I want to actually to go to layout blank. Now, let's get here a div with a title. Uh, that would be flash light. And we're going to have here the class title. And then another div that will have some other class. Now, well, I'm not crazy enough not to bring every, uh, something. So I, I brought the CSS already built. So. So here, let's put the CSS. OK, still missing something, right? So what's missing is actually the images. OK. Now in this one, and something that you will love that we can now do is actually we can now on the class field, we can actually put now expressions, meaning we can actually turn on and turn off things, just like that. Now, lamp. Exactly. So we now need a local variable that will tell us if the light is on or off. see that in a moment. Now, we obviously need to on click, actually, <laughs> or on touch, we need to turn on or turn off the light. So if the light is on, if it's on, oh, I didn't reference the actions. So if the light is on, so, I, so if it fits off, I want to turn on. And the other way around, if it's on, I want to turn off. Next. Let's change the variable. And see what the hell we have here. Wait. Oh.
You rock, you rock. Very well, so we have everything ready, I think. So, ha. let's see now how it goes. So we are publishing the application for the first time. And meanwhile, let's actually start configuring our build. So for this, I also have here some notes. So we are going to generate an iOS application to which I already have here the certificates. It's published. Let's generate in the app. Now, with the two minutes or one and a half minutes that I have now, I'm going to teach you how I dance or not. <laughs> Let's not do that, exactly. So, what is actually happening now? What we did was we created an out systems application just like you know so far. And now we are actually set, we configured how to build, so the certificates and everything that is required to build an iOS application. And what's happening is when we click generate, actually our code, our certificates were sent to the cloud. And on the cloud, the shell is being created with the logo of our application, with the name of our application. And it's being signed and everything so that it's ready for us actually to download it or to install it or actually to grab on it and put it on the public store. In the cloud, it's actually also fetching the the plugin that we actually added to the application and embedding all of that native code. Something that you should be aware is that immediately after the build, all of the credential, credentials and certificates are immediately deleted. They don't stay there. The advantage of having this in the cloud is that it avoids you, avoids the necessity for you to have an, an Mac server on your, on your uh, environment because actually, iOS can only be compiled so far in Mac servers. And this enables you to actually to be in a really simple and fast way to generate your applications. So now it's ready. Let's first actually start mirroring this mobile device in the wrong screen, obviously. Um, okay. Now, Let's actually, let's actually install it. The moment of truth is coming close. Oh, come on. Any, any tip? <laughs> the name is still wrong. The name is still wrong. Hmm. Why? Okay, so let's see if I can. I said that it could go terribly wrong, didn't I? Ta -da! So now let's install the application. And just like, oh, it's here. So we are starting. Now, starting. Okay, we have the application, now let's see if it works. Okay. <laughs> well, since I was not happy enough with this, I decided just to do something really quick for you guys. <laughs> and something that is really useful, which is to have more code on your application. 
So let me just reference this web log. Let's put it in the page. And actually, obviously, if I'm in, in a session, live session, I need an SOS button, <laughs> which is, in this case, your devs. <laughs> so as Paul said yesterday, one of the big advantages of the OutSystems platform and of this approach is that I immediately did the change. I actually opened the, applic the application again. And what happens is I didn't, I didn't need to generate the native shell again. So I basically just rerun the application. Now we have an SOS button. Oh, let me just put this here and bigger. So now let's do start SOS. And it does. So very well. Coming back to the presentation and to in order to let let you all go to have lunch. Yes, let me just remove that. Yes, wrong screen. <laughs> so let's see the presentation notes. So what are the final thoughts? Final thoughts is, as you can see there, our systems platform <laughs> is more mobile than ever. <laughs> You should explore all of these features, especially the native ones, so that you make your application more user-friendly and simplify the life of your users. There are more than 1,200 plugins, and as you have seen, this number has just changed in a couple of days. So every day, there are more and more plugins being added for the native functionalities. So when the new version is actually liberated of a new version of operating system or a new hardware is liberated to the market, there will be a plugin, someone creating the plugin for that immediately. Basically, as you have seen, mobile integrations are now easy. Really, really easy. So you should use and abuse of those. Thank you.